Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon and we're coming to you from Perry, Oklahoma, which is the home of the Noble County Free Fair. We'll have more on that later in the show. But first, there's some important farm bill deadlines coming up. And with information about those, here's Eric DeVees. Producers have an important deadline coming up related to the farm bill. Uh, September 30th is the deadline to sign their contracts at the FSA office. Last spring, you know, we had signups, we had an, an enrollment period, I should say, an election period for the programs that they were going to sign up for later this year. Well, it's later this year. We also had the acreage uh, update that took place this spring, but now is the final time. You, you, uh, so if you were in this spring, you're not done yet. You still need to be there um, by September 30th to sign those contracts. I wouldn't wait till September 30th. I call your FSA office now, drop by, see if you can make an appointment. I'm very doubtful they're going to extend this deadline because farmers have had all summer to make this happen. The other important news is that it was on almost nobody's radar screen. Sequestration has popped back up. Um, there was one uh, news article that came out that was a bit confusing. It said that the Farm Bill um, requires sequestration. In fact, it's not in the Farm Bill. That's a budget order, and so it comes through the normal budgeting process. And so the debate right now in Washington, D.C. is do we apply the 2015 rate sequestration rate or the 2016 sequestration rate. And the difference is 7.2% for 2015 or 6.8% for 2016. And so the language of the sequestration says that the, the, uh, the percentage is applied um, when, for the obligation. So the argument that's going back and forth is was the obligation incurred in 2015 and paid in 2016 or is the obligation 2016? So I've read from different sources. Some are saying that um, USDA is probably going to go with 6.8. Others are saying they're probably going to go with 7.2%. So that's up in the air at this point. But farmers need to be aware that what we thought they were going to get paid or what they might have thought they were going to get paid for farm bill payments for the 2015 cropping year may not be, likely will not be, as large as they anticipated. We'll know more soon when a budget order comes through from Congress. County Extension offices across Oklahoma are getting a lot of calls lately about webworms. And joining us now to talk more about webworms is Jackie Lee, our Extension Entomologist. And Jackie, we're kind of seeing these in a lot of trees all around the state. Give us an idea of what people are asking you. We're seeing these at greater numbers this year than we have in previous numbers, Lyndall, and I have received a lot of calls in my office concerned about whether or not these webworms could affect the pecan crop this year. And what is the answer? I mean, we have some decent pecans. We do, we do. <laughs> it's gonna be a good year for pecans in Oklahoma. And um, the good news is webworm actually does no damage to the actual pecan, Okay. but it can defoliate the tree. So the only um, reason you should be concerned is if you have a lot of webs in the tree that could cause severe defoliation. So it knocks the leaves off essentially, that's what the webworm does. Well actually the webworm feeds inside the web on the leaves okay. and as the caterpillars grow in size they make their webs larger and larger until they engulf a greater part of that tree and it'll completely defoliate that area. Okay, but do they eat the pecans too? They do not eat the pecans, no, just the foliage. Uh, yeah. And is it mainly in pecan trees or it's kind of in a lot of other different types of trees too? Well, actually in the south, it's, it's mainly hickories, pecans, and sweet gum trees. And they can also um, be a pest in fruit trees, um, but it's, it's rare. So not too much damage. What if it's a younger tree? Are they more susceptible? Now the younger trees are much more susceptible and I would recommend removing any webworms from trees that were less than five years of age. And then is removal pretty simple? Just kind of like it sounds? <laughs> it is. You just 
pretty much take a take a branch and, and run your, your hand along the branch to remove the webworm, or you can just prune out those limbs in the younger trees. Just make sure you dispose of the worms. Exactly, <laughs> so they don't start all right, over. Right, right. Is there, are there other uh, control options as well and how do you know when to use those? Right, so whenever you see um, severe defoliation um, in your trees, you will want to spray. Um, if you have the commercial spray equipment, um, you can use um, a BT product, Bacillus thuringiensis, or a methoxyphenazide product, um, work, which works very well um, on these pests. But you want to make sure um, that you do a spot treatment and that you really, really penetrate that web or the spray won't work. We've seen these the last few weeks. Are we kind of near the end of their life cycle or as we kind of get cooler temperatures probably? Right. This is the last generation for webworm. And usually this is the only damaging generation that we have. Um, these guys are gonna start pupating right about now. So the worms will fall to the ground and pupate in the soil. So they'll be finished up here in the next few weeks. Okay, we'll be glad for that. Yes. Jackie Lee, thanks a lot, great advice. And for more information on identifying and treating webworms, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Tuesday morning, our low air temperatures were close to average across the state. Most Mesonet sites had lows in the mid-60s. One day later, Wednesday morning lows were in the 70s for most mesonet sites. How have early September air temperatures compared to average? An air temperature chart from June 1st to September 15th for Shawnee is typical of many mesonet sites. Morning low temperatures that were below average for most of August have been above average in early September. Daily high air temperatures show a more pronounced trend. September's high temperatures at Shawnee were similar to a heat spike in early August. The high temperatures in early September were more significant because of the larger spread between the daily highs and the average daily maximum air temperatures. Before our recent rain, there was a sharp demarcation in soil moisture between western and eastern Oklahoma. In the dark brown areas in the west, the percent of plant available water was in the teens. To the east, in the green areas, it was easy to find mesonet sites close to 100% of their plant available water. Here's Gary with a look at rainfall and its impact on drought. Thanks, Al, and good morning, everyone. Now, hopefully, as you watch this, you're getting some kind of rainfall because we do have a spreading drought situation in the state. With that being said, let's take a look at the latest U.S. Drought Monitor report and see what we have. Now, as you can see, that drought that's been developing in southeast Oklahoma is now starting to spread to the north and to the west. We have a severe drought in far southeast Oklahoma and McCurtain County, but also down into south central Oklahoma now. Moderate drought surrounding that, and now we have that yellow, abnormally dry conditions uh, spreading all the way up into uh, the northern, north central part of Oklahoma, close to the Kansas border, down into southwest Oklahoma, and also a little bit of moderate drought down in southwest Oklahoma. The reasons are pretty obvious. Uh, the rains of last week helped some, but not enough. We still see deficits of at least two to six inches since late July. Uh, parts of south central Oklahoma have only seen about a half of an inch. In Idabel, which is usually one of the wettest stations in the state, it's seen less than an inch over that time period. Now the good news is the Climate Prediction Center on its U.S. Seasonal Drought Outlook sees drought either being removed or improving across those areas that already see drought uh, across southeastern and south central Oklahoma with no development likely at least through the end of December. So that would be great news if that map actually comes true. So like I said at the beginning, we need this rain to come through and stop this drought from uh, spreading farther to the north and west, and hopefully we can remove some of those colors from the map for next week. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It's been a fun year for sorghum in Oklahoma, and Josh, let's go through real quickly what producers should be doing in their sorghum fields right now. 
Well, we're, we're looking at sorghum across the state, right. and uh, some of it looks real good. Right. Some of it looks real bad. And and that's kind of the, the token of the summer crops this year where it looks real good, we're setting up to have an, an outstanding crop. Where it looks real bad, uh, we're setting up to not have so much of an outstanding crop. But uh, the reason for this is, is quite varied. Um, we had those those conditions, those environmental conditions. They were wet soils and, and unlike some of our other crops, when sorghum goes underwater, when it's real wet, it doesn't really like that and it, it kind of doesn't grow and it doesn't get off real well and that's one of the caveats of sorghum is that it actually needs to grow and get off to a really good start to produce a crop um, however where conditions were good we're looking real good. Uh, the, the heads are just producing uh, quite large heads, if you will. A lot of grain full of it. We just got to finish out the year. So we're in the fourth quarter of, of the sorghum crop this year. Is there anything producers need to be looking at in their fields? And we're not even in the fourth quarter. We're, on, we're in the two-minute <laughs> fraction of it. We, we need to finish it out. We need to go down and get that touchdown drive. And essentially what we're looking for is guys that still have sorghum in the field. They still need to be watching for the sugar cane aphids that has been something we've we've talked about more in Oklahoma this year than we have in the last couple years it's spread it's up here in this northern tier this northern couple tiers of Oklahoma up into Kansas so even our neighbors to the north need to make sure they're they're on the lookout for it um, and and when you're going out a lot of guys this year are wanting to go out and terminate the crop right. uh, because we're getting a lot of that those aphids and and we want to make sure to shut down that crop that way we can get the combines in the field and get it in the bin because that's really the only safe time for sorghum is when it's sitting in the bin. Once the sorghum's harvested, what's what's a crop that could come in after sorghum? Well, we have we have a couple options. Um, you know, growers essentially could go in with canola. Right. Um, the the margin for error there is really thin. Right. Uh, you're you're talking about a very quick turnaround. So if you had really really early planted sorghum, you've had it out of the ground, you've had the chance to work the ground a little bit, or if you're going into no-till, you've kind of let things settle a little bit. You have that option. Your other option uh, for a crop perspective is to go into wheat. Um, we have a lot of guys going into wheat for both grain and forage production this year. So that's something you got to look at into is is when you're going to be able to get your sorghum off, right. when that date is, kind of what the environmental conditions. Right now we're, we're pretty dry west of 35, so we got to start thinking, is it worth dusting it in? Or maybe it's worth maybe just going fallow with this. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start opening up a lot of things. If you lay your, you lay your field out of opening into corn the next year, soybeans the next year, going into grain sorghum, or coming back in about a year and a half and going back into wheat. Those are all options. What I tell guys is, is I like producing producers to get into a system mm -hmm. and then stick with that system because the benefits that you get from that traditional cropping system right. to where you have a legume in there, winter crop and a summer crop and just rotate it in there are much better than chasing commodity prices. So what I would suggest is stick with your system you've had. Uh, you, you know your, your land can support it, you know you yield well, so, so go in with what you're, you're typically doing. But for guys that uh, sorghum's new to their system this right. year and maybe they're not used to it, you have those options of wheat and canola canola is very thin, wheat's a lot more promising, or holding out and going into soybeans or corn next year. How, well, it, it, and you kind of alluded to it there, cropping systems are important, but, but how far out should a producer look as far as, you know, planting one out? Uh, can you look 30 years? Right. Yeah. <laughs> because that's essentially what you have to start doing is, is looking into the future. Um, commodity prices are going to change and things can be substituted out here and there. But one thing that a, that a grower doesn't want to do is just start chasing. Right. Um, going, going corn after corn after corn or uh, soybeans were up at near $15 a couple years ago, just going straight soybeans across the board, just because you never know what will happen that year. And so spreading your risk, having a little bit of corn, a little bit of soybeans, a little bit of soybeans or having some canola in with your wheat and rotating those together uh, the benefits have been proven they've been proven in the state they've been proven all over the world so it's it's better to, to have a nice array or a nice diversity of crops and have that rotation and stick with that rotation because it, it's going to work out best than just doing a monocrop or a monoculture single crop system but thank you much Josh Josh Lofton cropping system specialist here at Oklahoma State University we finally saw a 30 cent jump in wheat prices and here to talk about it is Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. And Kim, 
I guess the big question, have we bottomed out yet when it comes to wheat prices? Well, I don't know if we bottomed out yet, but we broke the uh, short run uh, downtrend that was established last, last July. Uh, prices on the KC December contract got down to uh, $4.66. They came back up and got through that 480 resistance level up in the 490s. It's back down around that 480. Looks like right now we're probably going to establish a sideways pattern. Now, one problem is that we haven't broken the long run downtrend that was established in December of uh, 2010. Uh, to, to break that, we probably got to get uh, KC prices up above $5 and maybe up uh, closer to $5.50. Now, what do you think the price of Oklahoma wheat would be without the abnormally high value of the dollar? Well, it depends on which index you use, uh, whether you use the futures or whether you use the, uh, you know, the, the trade weighted index by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And that's the one I'm going to use. Uh, it's uh, got the index about 18 percent above the eight-year and the 10-year average. Uh, if you look at the uh, export prices, an 18 percent above average uh, dollar index increases the price uh, our, in, for export a dollar or lowers a producer price a dollar. It could be a 75 cents, so let's go 75 to a dollar. That means current prices without this index should be in the 550 to five dollars and 75 cent range rather than 450 to 475. With that in mind, what price levels are you watching? Well, I'm watching the Kansas City December contract. Uh, the, the important price levels is 466. Of course, that's the bottom. That's been the lowest price on the uh, nearby contract since about 2007. Uh, the price is around four 480 above 480 it's going to it's going to stay up and challenge five below 480 it's going to go back and challenge at 460. if we can break five then we can run it up to 520 and we get it to 520 we're coming closer to breaking that long long term downtrend and maybe some slightly higher prices that's wheat let's switch gears now to corn and soybean prices how are these markets looking well those harvests are going relatively well you you look at traditionally how you should sell the uh, corn and beans uh, you've had a, about a 30 cent rally in corn. It looks like it's established the bottom, of, but we've got a lot of corn and a lot of beans to harvest yet. You look at the soybeans, they're wallowing around down around their low prices. So corns came up about 30 cents, maybe and it's established a sideways move. Uh, soybeans move around. The odds are they've created the bottoms, but I'd say there's probably about a 70% chance that we bottomed out and a 30% chance we'll go down another oh, 50 or 60 cents. And last but not least, for producers who have grain in the bin, what should they do? If they've got corn or beans, I'd go ahead and move it as I got it in the bin or took it across the scales. If I'm dealing with wheat in the bin, I'd probably stagger it in the market between now and January 1. Uh, you can either do the third and a third a third, or you can break it up if you've got quite a bit of uh, wheat in to say increments of four, sell a, a fourth of it now, the other three fourths, uh, you know, in October, November, and December. And I'd set kill dates and kill prices. In other words, say I'd have it sold by October the 14th or $5 and or $4.75, whichever happened first. When I sold that, that lot, then I'd set the target date and target price for the next one. Okay, good advice. Kim Anderson, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Those cow-calf operations that have fall calving herds will be growing some replacement heifers to be bred later in the fall, uh, probably starting around the middle of November. So that means that now is a good time to bring those heifers in and do a couple of operations as we bring them through the chutes. Number one, I would really recommend that we go ahead with our respiratory vaccination at this time, at least a month ahead of the start of the breeding season. So if you're going to vaccinate for IBR and BVD and whatever else that your veterinarian would recommend, now is a good time to bring those heifers in and get that chore taken care of. Also, if you have scales, I would suggest that you go ahead and weigh some of those heifers to see that they're growing at an adequate rate in order to have the minimum weight that you're going to have those heifers in at the start of the breeding season to be at least 60% of their mature weight. For example, 
If most of the cows in your herd are about 1,200 pound cows, then you better expect that the small end of this re replacement heifer crop needs to be 720 pounds at the start of the breeding season. And this is really critical for those herds that are going to use artificial insemination for breeding those replacement heifers. We want a high percentage of them cycling when we start our estra synchronization program and followed up, of course, with artificial insemination. So if we see that those heifers are a little bit behind, we now have about 45 days to increase the energy intake for those heifers in order to get them caught back up to have them at that 60 to 65 percent of their mature weight at the start of the breeding season. So again, I'd suggest you bring those heifers in at least 30, 45 days ahead of the breeding season, get the vaccinations that your veterinarian recommends, check to make sure that they're big enough and they're growing fast enough to meet that target weight at the start of the breeding season. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow Calf Corner. Timber stand improvement is an important aspect of forest management. One of the common ways to use timber stand improvement in Oklahoma is herbicide application. For wildlife objectives, we may want to thin a forest to create a herbaceous response in the understory. And there are several methods that you can use to achieve this. Herbicide is one of the most common and uh, there's, there's both selective and non-selective methods of herbicide. A, Sort of a non-selective would be something like tebithyron, which is, comes in a pelletized form, and you can spread that with just a cyclone seed spreader. And uh, you know why it's non-selective is it's soil activated, so any roots that come in contact with that herbicide, uh, that plant is at risk of being killed, that woody plant. So if you just want to create gaps or long, open, linear features through the forest, and you don't really care about what species or what size class of tree you're removing, that might be a quick and easy method. Um, a more selective method is something like a hack and squirt or a uh, stump treatment. And you could use a herbicide such as a mazapir, triclopyr, or even glyphosate in those applications. And be sure to read the label rates because the, the amount of herbicide you'll have to apply for those different herbicides will, will vary depending on which herbicide you're using and what the concentrate of that herbicide is. Uh, the stump treatment is very simple. You just cut the tree off and you spray the cambium. Uh, a lot of times people do this for smaller trees. For larger trees, often the hack and squirt is used, and this is where you're just making hack marks into the cambium, either with a hatchet, a, a saw, a chainsaw, um, and then you, you put the appropriate amount of herbicide in that cup that you've created with, with the hatchet and uh, allow that herbicide to, to, um, to kill that tree. And how many hack marks you make around the tree will be de determined by the diameter and also the herbicide you're using. So again, make sure to read the label rates for those applications. Any of these methods, though, can be used to really change the forest overstory and understory structure. And then you can use something like prescribed fire to maintain that over time. Periodic fire will continue to, to stimulate the understory vegetation and also to control undesirable woody plants from coming into that site such as eastern red cedar. And how often you use that prescribed fire will depend on your objectives. If it's for white-tailed deer, you might be burning once every three to four years. If it's for bob white, perhaps every two to three years. But consider some of these timber stand improvement methods if you own and manage forest land for wildlife. When county fair season rolls around, there's three things that you can count on every year. Livestock, beautiful quilts, and lots of great food. We have the chicken noodle ladies here in Noble County, as everyone refers to them. They've been doing a concession stand uh, for a long, long time. We cooked 180 pounds of hamburger for taco meat. Last Thursday, we met at 7 till 7, and we cooked 80 pounds of chicken breast and 140 pounds of thighs for our broth and then of course that meat goes in our chicken and noodles. Ten of these large pots of them a day. 
prepared by the ladies of the Noble County Chapter of the Oklahoma Home and Community Education Program. And they have a good time doing it. Debbie, hush. Please edit that, Dave. That's my Aunt Mary. She's playing with it. And this is her 40th year cooking for the fair. We all look forward to it, and we are all glad whenever it's over with, too, or we won't lie. We take, you know, different shifts because a lot of the women, you know, have grandchildren and children who are showing. Like tonight we had several leave to go show, watch their uh, cows. It's not Denver or Louisville. In some ways, it's better because you're showing with family. It's more, not that it's laid back. We're very competitive, but all four ag teachers here in Noble County, we always, I mean, we come to compete, but then afterwards we hang out and, and do things together. Many of these folks will make their way back over to the Women's Fair building for some homemade pie. The one on the right was third place in the fair, and the one on the left was... Oh, really? Yeah. But what they do with the money from the concession stand is awesome. They have a scholarship for two kids in our county every year. And we do Christmas stockings for the DHS store. To help buy supplies to go in those stockings so that the children will have Christmas. They purchase an iris scanning machine for the county. Uh, it's a biometric system where they can identify kids based on their iris. I love the fair kitchen because that's when you get acquainted with people. Chicken and noodles, like your grandma used to make. If she's a member of the Noble County OHCE, she probably did make them, all while helping her community. Well, that does it for this week on SUNUP. If there was something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From the Noble County Fair in Perry, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. You girls wanna go see the fair? <laughs> <laughs>